and also, um, invite you guys to talk, of course, but we'd also like to hear uh, from you guys as well, of course, some questions you know, as, we, as we move forward. I think it's not on. That's a mute. If you press that, it'll be mute. Oh. There, see if that is mute or not. Testing, testing. There you go. Okay. You are not mute. <laughs> Wow, it's been a while since I've seen that film of his. What? <laughs> really, it's like it's 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 just an off print of art making, you know, like the failures, the slippage, the chaos. I don't know. Just I, I found it really bizarre and awesome because I feel like he made his film in making this film. Because it's an impossible film. Do do you want to say a little bit about why you or you chose to show this in particular? Um, well, I thought actually it would be a really good um, companion piece formally, mm -hmm. uh, and to think about the um, complexities of a political poetics, like just to sort of consider the problems and. Um, maybe the, you know, some of his intentions, I think, in exploring uh, the tension of making. Uh, the, the film he proposes, I think, just crystallizes the problem of his aesthetic, basically. Do we want to maybe just take questions or comments that might be better or more interesting for sure. people here? Yeah. Curious what observations you had. Did he really ever intend to make the film? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, and yes. he intended to finish Petrolio, and he intended to finish St. <laughs> Paul, and yes, I think he did have that intention. The question is, what I think, whether or not uh, he didn't make it between 1970 and 1975. So mm -hmm. the question is, could he have made it in the way he imagined he would have made it after having made Salo? I, I, I just I can't imagine him making uh, a Medea or an Oedipus or a, yeah. a gospel with that archaic uh, preciousness. I don't know. That's my feeling about it. Can I? Yeah. Um, is, uh, in the first, your, your movie, yeah. uh, he's talking against uh, commercialism and uh, the consumer uh, culture, right, yeah. in Italy. So that is sort of like the humanities that he's talking about. So he is sort of arguing against himself. I mean, he's proposing something that is against his wishes for how society should be. Are you saying that because of his um, his attachment to the archaic? Um, I, I th yes. So, because I think that that is uh, he is contradictory. There's zero question in my mind about his thought, um, because he has this central problem, which is that his object of desire, as a gay man, is uh, young men from the lower classes. And so because that's his sort of drive, I think that there's, not in and of itself problematic, but I think it's just one of the places in which he inhabits a kind of contradiction that he wants something that is seriously problematic. I mean, in this case, for instance, you know, he, how is he not a colonialist? But, but one of his big things that he was saying is that we, I think, in his critique of consumer capitalism, is that we are in his um, in his essay from my film on on the um, language of things. He is talking about how culture is constructing us and, and be making us who we become. And so, on the one hand, uh, he's saying he could never remake that film, Akatone because he would never have like the core body of someone from the night from the 1960s but he's but he's also saying that we learn through repetition how to become how to become inducted into an ideology so for instance even the african students 
in, in the university are, are taking on the language of MI, MI Orestes. Yeah, how do they speak and, Italian? That's, I didn't understand how well, they Well, they're, they're, they're studying in, in oh, Rome. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's University of Rome. Is where the, yeah. Uh, the but yeah, this is, a, this is a sort of a crux of one of his, uh, his critique of consumer capitalism. So is that. That's an interesting point about... Um, He's trying to find the actors to do the... Already in 1970, this aspect of the culture disappeared already. This this uh, lower class uh, ethos, I think. Ethos is what you call it. Right? I don't know what he uh, I, I mean, think, this... um, it, I mean, he, he says that in 10 years, Italy has been completely transformed. Yeah, yeah that's But right, I think right. Akatone is a movie that he made after he went around to some neighborhoods in Rome with um, native informants who taught him the language, the dialect that was spoken, um, the Romanesco, and also he saw certain modes of living and some bodies, and that was not his native language. In fact, when he publishes um, uh, A Violent Life, he actually includes a glossary translating um, some terms in the novel into standard Italian. So what's happened in 10 years may not be that Italy has changed so much, but he has changed so much that he can no longer find those things that he found. And But yes, I think it, it was radically transformed by this economic boom, which was so much more um, intense in, in terms of the growth in GDP and the cultural transformations than anything that I've ever experienced, I think, in, in my lifetime. And also the, the coming of, to Italy of television radically transformed the country, and it happened relatively late there. So all of those factors, yes, made it so, immensely so what, different. <clears throat> uh, what he's trying to capture is the ethos of this prisoner, of his uh, like very uh, natural uh, objection to being held in Akatone. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. He's trying to capture this spirit, the spirit of uh, revolt or something. Uh, that is what disappeared? Or yeah, why did you what? choose that particular scene of all of anything in the film for, for that, think, to make it's that point? a very good scene. It's a very good scene. I mean, I think it is, is precisely the problem of... Um, He's he's not going to be saved. He he's he's already been he's already been taken into the court the court that's supposed to save the democracy. In fact, is the thing that's going to um, eradicate this entire. Um, where he says like he calls it the final solution, uh, you know, which is a little radical. But I mean, you know, the complete elimination of um, the underclass. So I don't know. I, I, I use that I use that sequence because I think it, it just, just articulates the the nature of um, you know prison thinking. You know what, what the institutionalization of and the induction of others into whatever the democratic state is. Can I ask? I want because I wanted to link sort of in, into some of your own interests in um, with with Petrolio and, and other and other um, aspects of, of Pasolini's work. One thing that I wrote down during Kathy's film, uh, actually during the scene in which you you use the, his final interview, um, is this is this discussion of cannibalism that comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I and I, I was sort of in between many th uh, things. First of all, I was thinking of of, of this in relation to uh, the famous. Um, Feces eating scene in Salo, uh, <laughs> um, and I was and I was also thinking about and and, and its really and, and its relationship to consumption in general, which you know I'd like to hear mm -hmm. you talk a bit more about. Um, uh, and also, uh, you know, the, one of the first things that you quote in the film is uh, uh, speaking, I think, uh, in, in particular about cinema's unique relationship to reality. This idea of appropriation of of the other's reality. I think the, undue appropriation of the other's reality. So, I mean, I think that it's a, a little constellation of things there, but I was really maybe thinking of this, this um, balancing of, of, of appropriation versus consumption and where, where cannibalism comes, you know, is, is figured uh, into that. Yeah. 
I don't know if that's a... <laughs> that, yeah, that, I think you're asking about that's a lot six of questions. Things. That's yeah. a lot of things, but um, yeah. But you I mean, we could talk know. about Petrolio, which would be a whole other possibility of, of entering into that um, question. I think that... Um, well, uh, the, the undue appropriation of the other's reality, I think, is exactly what's happening in the African Oristia, actually, which is a form of adaptation or projection that, um, that in a way, the metaphoric act or the poetic practice does. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether or not that superimposition can, can sustain If There's enough of a Venn diagram of intersection to, to be provocative or to activate an alternative or not, or whether they're just like so other, these two um, systems of meaning, um, African life and Greek tragedy, uh, are they so different that they can't possibly coexist? And so, um, I don't know, I, I see the appropriation of another's reality as the conundrum of a creative artist. And as soon as he shows up with the camera, he's talking about capturing He's talking about the very act of um, colonialism, basically, mm -hmm. you know, or hunting. I mean, if you've ever gone to the George Eastman house, you would have no question about the linkage between mm -hmm. cameras and guns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he so does not listen to what any of the Africans say. <laughs> he completely overrides their... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, he's in that scene. He's. I mean, he he was a very professorial figure, and like some professors, hopefully not once here, he actually just is sort of using them to um, basically give his own lecture in that particular scene. Exactly. But also the interpretation of the Earth's side is also very strange. This particular one. Why isn't he? Validating the furies of the humanities, given his, given his own argument. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think because he's a bit of a martyr, and, and he wants to say that that's lost. It's lost forever. I mean, he really his 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 quote on the beach in my film, where it's just like, and we don't know what to do. We might be waking up, but we can't change it. It's it's completely falling away. Anything, any diversity, any any dialect. All of these things are being homogenized before our very eyes, like in so little time. And so I, I think that... Is it cynical? No. Uh, is what cynical? Is, that one is it sort of defeatist, cynical? you mean? I, I mean, yeah, I mean, is that one of these cynical? I mean, you could say Athena's... When Athena addresses the humanities, for instance, you could say it's completely political thing, right? I mean, she's totally... You know, taking all the power away from the people and tells them you are the well meaning ones, right? I mean, that name in itself is a complete deception, right? Over what they will become. And and he takes such a patriarchal view of what the meaning of the institution of those, the court and so forth is. You know, I think it's, he doesn't get that from, um, he doesn't get that from the Greek play, he gets that from 19th century interpretation. From, you know, just, just to respond a little bit to one of Leo's points, I, think. <laughs> um, I mean, in, in that essay that um, Kathy quotes in the beginning of her film, he's, I think, really responding to, he couldn't not be responding to some of the doctrines of neorealism that are developed in filmmaking beginning in the late 40s in Italy and then codified in um, some more um, some critical writings, especially by uh, Zavattini mm. in the early 50s. And he comes to filmmaking after that, and in a way that the movement is over, but he has to, in that, in that essay, he has to somehow deal with that legacy. And that's why his version of what his camera is doing with relation to reality through poetics and through this kind of free and direct discourse is one of the things that makes him, you know, characterizes his whole aesthetic style as a filmmaker, maybe with the exception of Solo, if that's something a little bit different and separated off. So I think that also even um, responds to some of the questions people have had about the, this very strange movie, um, because
because he's dealing with this legacy of basically setting up a camera and um, creating a quasi-documentary look at at others who might be, um, you know, as he says, they have to be from the working class or the subproletariat. And then how do you deal with that through your own, through his own you know, voice and his own position as a bourgeois intellectual? And that's that's some of the stuff that it's getting worked out in this weird in the mm. weird these weird notes. Yeah, and the and I think you know he's sort of he's I, I think he's sort of initiating around this time the the trilogy of life probably mm -hmm. as comes a couple of years later probably um, uh, and thinking about the um, uh, uh, as as he moves into Salo the 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 his change in thinking maybe about the ability to sort of represent these bodies not only. The, the, the historical ability to even find them, but also um, the, the the ways in which the cinema actually transforms them in positive and negative ways. Mm -hmm. and it seems to me that this um, this this that, that, which is why I think that I, I sort of stuck on this question of cannibalism is who's incorporating how are the who's incorporating whom I guess is is is, is the question that, that that comes up in in, in, in the Orestes. So. I mean, Metaphorical kind of, sorry, metaphorical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, oh, yeah. Of course. I yeah. think the, the <laughs> yes. cannibalism refers to Salo in particular. Yes. yes. In, yes. The, in that interview. For sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but conceptually, he is talking about digestion, and so there is a question of whether or not these you know these taboos, these structural taboos, which you know we could all be appalled by, you know shit and cannibalism, you'd just be completely grossed out by it. But meanwhile, the violence that takes place every day, not necessarily attributable to the state alone, but to, to, I mean, what is the impulse of violence, I think, is actually a very important um, question for him, which is what makes his death so interesting, I think, is what sort of a, a very important um, cast that it puts on everything he was writing about during the last year of his life, which is all, a lot of it is in, in this film. Um, I was going to say something else, but it slipped my mind. I don't know, there's so many thoughts circulating. But I think it has to do with digestion, and I think it has to do with the problem of the dialectic, actually, and, and whether or not it, 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 a synthesis is possible. You know, and, and in fact, some of the... So the students were like, no, the, the one student said, no, since this is totally not possible. Mm -hmm. right. So he's living in like a constant tension and contradiction of a dialectical mm -hmm. model that it cannot resolve, even momentarily, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Well, the, the, for me, the, the, the putting of the two films together was, I think, so right. Because the sort of objectification of the body of the men in both films, mm -hmm. and the romantic notion at the same time, which sort of s softens the objectivity in a way, but creates this intellectual friction because of the ideas that he's p putting forward, that, that, that it is in this, this dialectic that doesn't resolve. There's no new, nothing comes forward, at least uh, that I could wrap myself around. Yeah. And I think that contradiction is uh, is the real gift that 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 he has given us, um, and and to go to that uh, sense of uh, Reichenstahl also goes to Africa and looks at bodies too. You know, a European sort of way of looking, a woman mm -hmm. looking at bodies. Um, so it's it it's it's I think it's very confrontational. To uh, if, if you don't become too intellectual about what does this mean, just to look at the, the, the cinematic aspect of it, of what does he see in these bodies, and what do we see him seeing in these bodies? That those kinds of thoughts were, were. Um, I was that's where I was left with, with the film. Your film is quite beautiful to look at, by the way. I just want to just you. say it just for you. I'm interested in the notion of the stranger, and I think that part of what happens, one of the another reason why I wanted to bring these two films together was because uh, there's something intrinsically strange about entering the public square with a camera, and and it, we we forget that now because we're so enmeshed in reproducing our realities 
at any given moment, it's like who knows how many cameras are involved. We're, we're aware of being watched at all times. So what's I think interesting about um, his film is is that they look back, and, and there is that just, and, and that seems to be like a classic problematic in ethnography. We, of course, they're going to look back because it's strange. Mm -hmm. It's strange. But he... It's exciting. Right, and probably loud. I mean, it's also, I mean, my camera certainly is. It's a Bolex, so it's, you know, a very loud thing. Um, in any event, I, I think that there's um, there's something about coming up in the, in the public square with uh, with our out, with outsider status. I mean, I'm making a film in Europe. I'm in the streets of Rome with this camera, and I'm a woman, so I am definitely strange. There's no question about that. And I think that he is too when he goes to Africa. It's just he's strange, but he doesn't look away. And I think that in a way he is sort of saying in order to, it may not be possible to resolve our differences, but we have to look at each other. We have to begin there by looking at each other. And those students do. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to say something that really struck me in seeing your film this time, and it, it's related to this question because, um, so Pasolini did a lot of location scouting because for many of his films, the locations were really important, and especially this, this, the films that he made, which were sort of remakes of classical texts. He went to different places and to see if they would work out. So it just so happens that these notes got made into a film, but you could also have other films of his location sh uh, scouting, including in Rome, when he ran around to these neighborhoods to do location shouting and then scouting and maybe also some... Uh, boy scouting as well. <laughs> and um, anyway, the, the scene that you, um, the footage that you take from the ride, which is the kind of location scouting of the death scene in, in Ostia, is amazing. And the, the microphones and the woman responding and kind of repeatedly inserting the fact that she found the body and repeating the narrative several times is really not only uncannily echoes some of the scenes where Pasolini himself is interviewing people, not only in this film, but especially in um, the um, love meetings, yeah. or Comizzi d'amore, which was in the, um, which is, there was a still in the slide that you showed for the upcoming conference. And um, in the last week, because it's, uh, the anniversary of the death was actually um, Tuesday, the, the second, um, yesterday. No, uh, sorry, Monday. Monday. Yeah. Yeah. I really am losing track That's of the right. days. Um, <laughs> it, in the last week, the Italian news um, and newspapers have been absolutely filled with articles about the death scene, the death, the, um, the, the ongoing controversy about his death and his murder. And one of the interesting things is that there's there are some stills, uh, shots of people at the site right after the body was discovered and then like a couple of hours later and even later in the afternoon. And there have been recently people, journalists, who have identified that some of the people who were there on the scene like maybe three or four hours after the body was discovered are actually people that came from elsewhere who are members of the uh, P. Due, which was this very extreme right-wing terrorist group and that may or may not have been linked to uh, figures in power in the state hydrocarbon entity who may or may not have wanted <laughs> Fellini, uh, Fellini, Pasolini dead <laughs> for various reasons. And so there have been these photographs in the Italian press of people scouting actually location scouting the scene with like circles drawn around people who probably were members of right-wing organizations or representatives of such and it's it's this intense flood of imagery around that scene and so the fact that it's in your film but before you could have imagined what would happen you know three years later on the anniversary of the death is this 
kind of overwhelming series of images in, in my brain right now that I think make, makes your film very interesting for that. And I don't know if you also had a feeling about your position as location scout. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I did go to Ostia, but I didn't shoot anything there. Mm -hmm. I recorded audio, and, and there, there is a, there's a bit of the track, because I recorded it on a cassette tape, which is completely archaic. But I, <laughs> it, it runs throughout the mm -hmm. film, actually, yeah. um, very quietly in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, so why did you choose not to shoot in Ostia? Like so many people have done, there have been... I don't know, what well, is it, it five is or six so films about Pasolini's death, and then there's a scene from uh, Dear Diary where yeah. um, Moretti goes on his uh, Vespa out and just sort of drives around there, so there's no lack of precedent, so why did you choose not to? I was just so fascinated by the archival material mm -hmm. that I decided... To, to utilize that. And the archival material in my film, and I'm curious about his archival material in his film, actually, um, none of that was cleared. So this mm -hmm. film has sort of a limited life, and yet it is, I think it's a very important part of uh, uncovering or exposing or exploring historical documents that is what remains of a scene, of a situation. And we don't have access to those. Those don't necessarily get put into films. So some of these images are, you know, that scene of the interview with the couple, that I have not seen that anywhere except where I saw it and shot it off the television. Because otherwise you wouldn't have access to that information. You wouldn't be able to see that. Um, also the obliteration of this woman and her insistence on being present, you know, which was, you know, there is a... There's a bit of a feminist drive in my film, too, because I do think there's a certain amount of misogyny in Pasolini. But, um, <laughs> Steph is like, uh, yeah, absolutely true. The use of the woman's, the, uh, the use of the woman and the woman's voice. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that. Um, It, it's just how I came to his texts, is hearing those words through my own voice. And so for me, it's it's not strange or even deliberate. It just felt the, what it should be. I hadn't really thought about it. And then, of course, there's been a number of really thoughtful theorists who are like, yes, that's the free and direct discourse. And I'm like, really? What's that? <laughs> okay, maybe I can finally understand what that means. You know, there is no author or there's a sort of an absented author who's also there. And th this is the question I have, or, or a thing I'm interested in exploring as a maker, which is how can, you, how can one interpret or adapt uh, pre-existing text um, and let it be itself while also be having some sort of um, impression or engagement with it as part of the adaptation, that the adaptation is, it is that encounter, as opposed to dissolving uh, one author in exchange for another. But that's the nature of, of an aspect of camp, which I'm not saying it okay. is camp. I'm not saying it's camp, but yeah. that is the nature of that gender, uh, you know. What about sure. the, woman, the woman actress? Amanda. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that um, it does occur to me, of course, that there's a lot of heteronormativity going on in the film um, in terms of Boche and Amanda mm -hmm. and their interaction. But I was very fascinated, I mean, the whole last third of my film is an interpretation of certain scenes from Petrolio. And so I became very interested in this split protagonist, Carlo, uh, which is in the novel, is the protagonist. Um, it, the the one of them sort of can, becomes a woman, and it's like kind of a dramatic moment. And I think that there's a I'm I'm interested in where where the feminine resides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just looking. I, I'm not sure in case people don't really know. Um, 
So the last work that Pasolini was working on and never finished and actually never wanted published, but it was published against his wishes posthumously, was called Petrolio. And Kathy called it a novel, and at some points he called it that, but he also calls it a poem and a summa of his life, and it's a, it's a lot of other things. It's not necessarily a novel. It's a very strange text. It was over 600 pages long when he said he wasn't even half finished, so we don't know if, it, if he ever would finish, have finished it, what it would have been. And um, I... I, there, it's, it's a very complicated text, and it's actually a series of notes, which is another link between your film and, and Petrolio and the notes for the African um, Oristaya. But part of the text, um, and not, it, it's not a novel that follows one character, but there is one part of it in which there is... A, a, a body, a male body, that splits into two. And one is called Carl, uh, Carlo with a C, and one is called Carl with a K. And those two bodies end up splitting apart and doing other things. And then there are several sex transformations in the novel. It's not just one. Mm -hmm. And they happen sometimes at really awkward moments, like Carlo, the male, is sitting at a dinner party and suddenly, like, looks under the table and realizes that he's lost his penis, and that must be, like, a little bit awkward. <laughs> and then, like, and then at another time, it, it comes back, and it, there, it, it's a really, it is really interesting. Um, it's, it's sort of one aspect of the text that um, people really tend to focus on, because it's, it's really extraordinary, especially in contemporary Italian literature or, or filmmaking, you don't get that kind of really weird um, gender um, examination. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty unique. I mean, there are other aspects of the text, too. So um, I guess what you're, I mean, I was interested then. So for you, this, these actors and this, especially the presence of this woman, have to do with that aspect of the text. Um, and she's also just a stand-in for me. Oh, I mean, okay. she's also um, in. It, she's she's walking through the Bologna train station. She's she's in the Villa Aldini. She she's moving through these spaces, and so am I, because we see the image of her moving through these spaces, and I'm shooting those images. So in a way, it's a it's a subject. It's a stand-in subject. Um, what about the older woman? Ah. Uh. Oh, that scene. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's got its own... Um, and the lipstick. It's sort of, uh, you know, Petra von Kant, you know, it's a little <laughs> bit of a chamber drama of, of working out some of these um, elements of deviance, let's say, uh, that is not just the province of gay men. Um, gratefully. So, <laughs> so, so that, that was part of it too, was wanting to, um, inhabit that space and also to think of a kind of, and have, and have another moment on the bench, which when Noel Birch saw the film, he's like, I have absolutely no idea what's happening on that bench in the park with these two women, but it, there's something emotional happening that is clear. Um, and for me, anyway, I felt like it was it was the possibility of having, you know, objectified and destroyed one another, and then and then being confronted and returned with the tool of that objectification, because it, in essence, he he, I think Pasolini's main main concern is this turning of people into things, this in instrumentalization that. Um, that capitalism is has has perfected. I mean, that's why he says it's it has perfected what fascism set out to accomplish, and it does it perfectly uh, because we we all drink the Kool Aid, you know, we're all in it. Um, and so I think that he's constantly pushing out, pushing out, and pushing out so that it's not a, it's not a permanent structure. 
our induction and our and our indoctrination and our uh, inscription. Mm -hmm. I think that might be a good place to leave it. Because we have to, oh, there are hands. We can. Should, should we? Should we talk yeah. over? Over? Yeah. We should we have to talk over cookies and wine and things like that? Or would that? Would that? Would that it's Unless, in a nice I mean, long. long mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe or would you, would you like to say? Just, just, just say I just was thing. curious. You started to talk earlier about where the feminine resides. Yes. And I was curious what you wanted to say about that, and also whether that's a question about you as a filmmaker or about Pasolini. Oh, that's me as a filmmaker. Um, I, I think that, and, and this, this was also true in another film I made, which was an adaptation of Andre Breton's novel, Nadja, mm. uh, where um, I discovered his self-portrait, which was a collage of himself in front of a microscope, and behind bars was this beautiful blonde woman. Um, this is a self-portrait. So I had, I had this thought that, you know, that the misogynist has a part of themselves that they can't inhabit uh, fully. And so it's projected out as a problem in the other. And I think that this is also a very useful um, model t towards understanding race relations in this country, um, particularly thinking of James Baldwin's extraordinary and still timely um, book, the fire next time. We're really talking about these repressions uh, of oneself that get projected as fear. And in his film, he's describing this fear as the future, um, but actually it's, it's also very much marking our social interactions with one another, these, these inabilities to um, reside. And maybe it's not just the feminine, it's the thing that feels strange Let's just put it that way. It's that thing that feels strange in oneself. Um, fem the feminine feels sometimes very strange to me, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Whatever that is, I don't know. What, what aspect of objectification is he concerned with? Is it taking people out of context? Is that basically what he's addressing? I'm not exactly, I just want to put my finger on that. Well, I think in his critique of consumer capitalism, he's interested in the ways in which um, I think uh, we are becoming things through repetition. We are becoming identifiable with uh, things that are impostors that are being sold to us. So I think in a way it's not exactly objectification as it is um, sort of reproduction, reproducing. But I think objectification is something that sterilizes or, or petrifies uh, the diversity of being human, and it's intrinsically problematic as a filmmaker, because insofar as you frame anything, you are decontextualizing it, you are, you know, two-dimensionalizing it, you are any other forms of um, restriction to what's actually before the camera. So, I, I don't know, I feel like he... I, I think um, in many of his writings... He's very he's he's very much a humanist, and I think that your response is is maybe somewhat even more interesting than uh, what he was really getting at. I think, which was a, a kind of nostalgia for um, a more um, a, a less less of a standard Italian culture and more of a culture of um, of uh, regions and dialects and of a, of a more archaic culture. And so it was a nostalgia for a past that you can't go back to. And it wasn't necessarily worked out through um, a, a kind of theoretical so much as a, an effective um, way of uh, thinking. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. But in the scene with the, with the African, uh, I'm going to call them students, but uh, looking very Western, but what I was very touched with was that he allowed them to speak, and they took the opportunity to speak back to him about what Africa was to them and not to the European. And it was there was more hope in that scene than in any other part for me, than any other part of the movie. And and the sort of the, the conflict that they have being these students, whatever class they're from, in Rome, and yet 
tr being African. You know, I I thought that 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 was very beautifully done in the in the, in the way he they responded to him. You know, the Ethiopian in particular. You know, the, Yeah, it, it was relevant. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, maybe we should uh, thank uh, Kathy and, and Karen for uh, for thank you for having me and thank you.